Thank you everybody so much uh, for coming here today and for those guests who are joining us on GoToMeeting. And we're going to be recording the presentation both in the room and on GoToMeeting, so um, if you're not able to attend all day, um, you'll be able to get some coverage one way or the other. So we're here to celebrate Bob, and I want to um, say a huge thank you to Dr. Ben Kurtman, CMIS Director, for making all of this possible today. So very quickly, thank you. And of course, to our gracious host, allowing us to visit and uh, have the entire event on its hands, I'd like to welcome Dean Ronnie Avatar to welcome us here today formally. Hey, thank you, Erica. Thank you, everybody, for coming and participating into this uh, great, uh, uh, great uh, meeting. Okay, it's great in one sense, it's uh, sad in uh, many other. Uh, obviously, uh, Bob, the career has been uh, spectacular for many uh, people around here. We are all here to uh, testify to that. Bob and I have a very long story. I'm going to tell the story. The, the story. I believe that uh, uh, we met totally coincidentally in uh, Nailport at the, at, the, at the carpet, right? The red carpet of the United Airlines. So you see how long that date, because since then the, the, the company has, uh, has uh, departed. But uh, we sit in the red carpet. I have no clue, uh, you know, who got this. I believe that I was on my trip to the Amazon and not looking forward to it. And I'm sitting, you know, working on my computer, and I hear a guy next to me that is talking about modeling of hurricanes. And I think, what that can be, okay? And so I let the guy speak on the phone for a kind of a half an hour, explaining to somebody what to do and how to do it. And then I pop up and I say. I don't think that I know you, but uh, you know, I'm uh, such and such from the Radbeer University, and that was his name, and I had recognized the name that was already, you know, very, very well known at the time. So we are talking about uh, 20 plus years, or 12, 30, almost 30 years ago. So unbelievable. So yeah, Bob has been in this business, okay, of, uh, of the research and leadership for a very long time. And so we are here on the one hand to celebrate that uh, the multiple achievements that he has had as a teacher, educator, as well as a scientist. And uh, it's kind of a sad, okay, that uh, uh, it takes, uh, I am here for about 10 years now, and it's sad to have an event like that to see so many uh, faces in the audience that uh, in the past uh, 30 or 40 years, um, uh, we have uh, met at a different meeting. I just met somebody that I had not seen since the time uh, I was on sabbatical at GIS, so that's another 30 plus year uh, of web is here with us from, uh, from Boulder. And of course, uh, uh, Dr. Estileni is here also. So a lot of, uh, and uh, Eugenia, <laughs> of course, yeah. So I really appreciate uh, uh, the, the effort that everybody has made to come and to participate in this event. And it is a true, true pleasure to uh, host you here at the Rosensteel. Obviously, Rosensteel and NOAA next door are uh, collaborating on the multiple issues, and it is a truly very productive and enjoyable uh, collaboration. So, Bob, good luck for your next uh, phase in life, okay? And uh, I look forward to uh, hearing the presentations today. And uh, you know, if you have any questions about the uh, Rosen Steel and the place, I'm more than happy to discuss that with you. And also, thanks again for uh, Erica and for uh, Ben to put this uh, event together here at Rosen Steel. So let's have a great day. Let's enjoy it, and let's uh, make sure that the Bob is um, uh, living with a good memory of this uh, place. Okay, so take care. Bye. Good morning, everyone, uh, and thanks for accepting my invite for the symposium, and thanks to everyone for being here. My name is Gopal, and uh, I've been coordinating with several of you uh, related to the symposium. Uh, the, I wanted to briefly, uh, about a couple of minutes I'll take, and where the symposium started. Now, it started with uh, one of my Facebook blogs that I wrote. And it was all based on uh, a certificate that Bob Atlas gave not only me, but most, most of people who have interacted with him. I'll read the last lines of the certificate. In, in appreciation of the excellent contributions you have made to NOAA and the nation during my tenure as AML director, 
he directly reached out to the people. It's not only me. This is a reflection of not only myself. If you ask several of the scientists and employees, they'll feel the same way about Bob. Now, having said that, from the science point of view, uh, I, I would also like to uh, I would also like to mention about this is a game called cricket, where uh, where there are two innings basically where a batter. Uh, has two chances to play the first innings and the second innings. In the first innings, some batters get out at zero, and in the second innings, they might score a century. That was what happened with the hedge war system as well as my career uh, with the hedge war system, and it's all thanks to Bob, and he made it happen. That's what I've illustrated here. After that, I will let Erica to the MC and uh, welcome Erica. You can you can go ahead. That's all I have. <laughs> Thank you, Gopal. <laughs> Thank you, Gopal. And I and I do give Gopal. Um, while I'm working with him a lot to make this event happen, Gopal was the lead on helping to um, get all the speakers together. So thank you very much for making sure that this happened. Um, our first speaker today is uh, the director of NOAA's. Uh, National Weather Service, Dr. U uh, Louis Uccellini, and I'm not going to give a lot of background and bio to each of the speakers because I think that's part of what's special about today is everybody who's presenting has touched Bob's career uh, and shaped it in some way, shape, or form, and probably a little vice versa. Um, and especially uh, from uh, Dr. Um, Uccellini's talk, I think you'll you'll see that. So, um, would you please join me in welcoming Louis? Okay, so um, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, I was sort of the adopted child into uh, into their unit of class, and I was wondering if Milt was here yet, and he's not, because he'd probably have a different side of the story, and we would never get to the to the rest of the uh, conversations here. But uh, I do want to, um, first of all, uh, thank uh, the uh, organizers for inviting me down here. And just to let you know, Bob kind of bo uh, body slammed me. He told me that I had to be down here. So we, we adjusted my schedule uh, accordingly. So what I want to talk about is that uh, we were joined uh, together um, early on in our careers. And um, I'm, I'll you know, just get right to the chase here. Um, we shared an office. Um, at Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, I did not work for Milt. I did not work for Eugenia or Bob or, or Shukla. Sometimes I felt like I worked for Michael Gill, but that's another story. Uh, but I worked for Joanne Simpson, but um, as you'll see, um, how did I wind up down there on the ground floor? Um, the quasi-geostrophic debate, first thing we start debating is quasi-geostrophic theory. So this has nothing to do with the tropics, folks. If you're expecting tropics here, you got to have to wait for later talks. Then the uh, President's Day storm happened, and the, um, that drove both our careers in certain ways, as we'll show. Then post glass, real short. Um, I went to the Weather Service in 89, and he came over. And we actually interacted on these topics as well, the quick scat, the LIDAR winds, uh, the joint were you Were you an acting director early on, or were you actually? Uh, no, but I helped. Uh, helped convince the NASA administrator to form the joint. Center. Right, right. And then, we, and then Ricky Root came on as the, as the first director. Right, okay. And then his role down here, was in, with respect to H Warp, we, we already heard that. So this was the, um, uh, the first uh, picture, I think, was taken of uh, folks who came uh, to Goddard. Um, I'm standing in the middle. I had hair then, if you don't recognize me. <laughs> But there are some folks from uh, from Milt's uh, shop. Uh, there's Raymond Baker's on the left, all the way over there. David Strauss. Uh, Paul Schaff was actually in your group as well, I believe. Uh, so he's standing he's standing right next to me. There are others. There's Michael uh, Michael uh, 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 Mike King, and then there's Jerry North and Claire and the like. So uh, this was um, that's, that was actually put in um, into the bulletin to try to entice other people. To, uh, to come to Goddard. Uh, the laboratory should be for atmospheric sciences, not hemispheric. So, ouch. Um, uh, so the, um, that was created in 1977. Uh, Dave Atlas, this was Dave Atlas's answer to NCAR um, West, uh, where he emphasized science first, missions will come later. And then Milt Hallam 
I, I guess it was a guest, right? It was the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. There was the group was up there uh, working with Jasper, and he came down. and I always felt there was a misunderstanding between Dave and Milt that Milt thought he was going to be in charge of the whole thing. I didn't find out until he got got to Goddard, but um, he had um, he had um, a um, a palace compared to what we had coming in into the other branches. Um, they actually had office space, and there's Milt now. So Milt, you came at exactly the right time. So um, so Milt um, had this palace on the ground floor. When I joined uh, Glass in 1978, there were no offices for new hires, zero. So we were all put in these bullpens, um, and, uh, and we shared a conference room. And somehow I got invited to Milt's uh, Milt, uh, space and to share an office with Bob. I think they, they must have asked Bob if it was okay. And he said, didn't know me from home wall, as far as I know. But I got assigned to this office. And that's how we hooked up. He came later after that picture. And um, um, that was um, um, that was interesting times. So I, I should note that one of the first things I had to do was get on, and Milt made it clear that it was his computer uh, for the whole Goddard Laboratory for Atmospheric Sciences. So I, for me to get three cylinders, I was interviewed by Yehenya, by Shukla, and by Michael Gill for three cylinders on an Amdahl. And uh, it was worse than my PhD exam, but I used the old trick to get, you know, when you go into a PhD exam for the students out there, you get, you get the, uh, you get the uh, group to argue with each other, and then you walk out clean, right? <laughs> it didn't take much to get Mike Gill and Schuttler and Yehenya going. So, you know, they just, they just went at each other's throat about one thing or another, and I got my three cylinders. So um, that was my introduction to NASA. Anyway, the range of the time was quasi geostrophic theory. I was doing stuff on jet streams. Uh, Bob was more ingrained in, in the quasi geostrophic theory than I was, and I'll get into that in a minute. But cyclogenesis was being explained in terms of uh, thermal and vorticity attraction. And diabetic processes were sort of taking a back seat at that time. Okay, baroclinic instability theory, uh, you know, purely a dynamic approach uh, kind of thing too. Uh, but I, I do, um, I, I've noted here a Holton's reminder, and I'll get to that in a minute, um, as to why I wasn't necessarily enamored with that coming out of the University of Wisconsin. So the President's Day storm happened in 79. Bob, when did you come down? You came down in 70, early 79? 78. So I came in August and you came right after that, right? Yeah. So this is the storm um, that basically changed um, the, uh, at least the extra tropical field of meteorology. Um, this, that storm that you see off the East Coast at 12Z on the 19th uh, developed very rapidly. It, it took on the form of a hurricane looking um, entity, but one has to be careful that an asymmetric cloud structure, high clouds to the north, low clouds to the south, and that asymmetry is a very important part of the uh, interaction of dynamics and uh, latent heat release for uh, rapidly developing storms. And of course, DC got absolutely buried by snow um, that um, they actually took the warning down before that rapid development phase, so that was a lot of fun as well. Now, Bob will claim that he predicted this storm on the Friday. This happened on a Sunday night into a Monday a holiday, and Bob always claimed that he predicted it. And we all say we predicted it, but we didn't predict that. Nobody predicted this rapid development phase. Um, as you see on this one, um, the, um, the, the storm uh, developed. Uh, that, that was one of the coldest high pressure systems uh, that we had. There were, high, there were high temperatures as far south as North Carolina and Virginia that were lower than the record lows for that day as the storm came in. So a very cold air mass. And that's really important when we get into some of the work that Bob did uh, with respect to uh, the uh, boundary layer heating and its role in, in this development. And there were several phases of development. We had the coastal front with a band of snow and then the rapid development phase uh, with a separate area of snow. And, um, and you see this in the satellite imagery. Um, you got that first plume of moisture coming in that was the first, uh, and, and you see how during the day that actually shrank. So the satellite meteorologists in, in uh, Nesnes, um actually were promoting uh, that kind of features 
something where um, if you see that happening, this the snow would be decreasing. Um, and then you got that that literally that band of clouds that's uh, forming on the north part of a rapidly developing storm. So as this thing was decreasing, the, the forecast has actually took down all the warnings, not expecting that secondary development uh, to occur. So that's one of the reasons why this storm was um, um, so uh, such a difficult uh, one to forecast and had such an impact because people literally woke up to a two feet of snow on the ground that they weren't expecting when they went to bed that night. So um, heavy snow warnings were posted early in the morning of the 18th. We got four to seven inches of snow and then it stopped. And that was with the coastal front. They took all the warnings down about uh, eight, nine o'clock at night. So when people went to sleep that night, they weren't expecting to wake up to waist deep snow uh, the following morning. And it was an incredible snowfall. Um, four to five to six inches of snow fell per hour for three hours just before sunrise. And I happened to get up for that. I was I was out in the middle of my neighborhood waking, you know, as people um, woke up, uh, they saw this snow falling. And I see Wayman Baker just arrived. Um, Wayman actually slept through the snowfall. And, you know, uh, he tells a story where he, he couldn't see without his glasses. So when he woke up in his apartment, he saw it was white, but didn't realize how deep it was. So he got ready to go to work that morning, even though it was a federal holiday. He said he opened up the door from his apartment and the snow was up to his waist. And the first person he called was me to ask what the hell happened. So um, anyway, it was quite a storm. So why did this motivate the entire community? Um, the magnitude of the event, DC was shut down for, for days. And I can tell you, not all cities are created equal. If something like this happens in Washington, D.C., and you're in the weather service, from experience now, I can tell you it's different, okay? Um, the forcing debate, uh, low level versus upper level, the diabetic versus adiabatic dynamic, the limitations of the QG framework uh, comes, to, comes um, here as well. Uh, the operational model failures, uh, there's no other way to describe that. Um, the model of the day was the LFM, uh, for those old enough to remember. Um, and then what happened here from a research point of view, basically the research community uh, and folks in the operational community as well said enough. Um, the Cyclone Workshop was actually initiated uh, by NSF. Uh, Ron Taylor uh, contacted Don Johnson and Peter Haas uh, to get that organized. And that workshop still meets every two years. Um, really terrific. So uh, this is Holton's um, um, in his third edition, page 178. And this is the, the thing that um, uh, I used to argue about, argue for. Um, you know, people were so hung up on warm air infection and uh, uh, vorticity infection. But the fact is, is that magnitude of those infection patterns, first of all, it's pretty, you can't discuss uh, forcing uh, with infection patterns, for one thing. But it's really there to su sustain the balance. Uh, hydrostatic and geostrophic balance. And uh, what we are finding in these snowstorm situations now, it's even more obvious, is that these rapid development phases, um, the interaction of latent heat uh, with uh, um, a dynamic system that's prone for amplification represents an unbalanced flow regime. It's not, it's not working towards a balanced state, it's working away from a balanced state. And um, I'll just note here, uh, this is isotropic analysis. This is foreign to a lot of people, but uh, this is what uh, we did our work in uh, the group that, uh, up in Joanne's shop. And I just want to note here that the, um, this jet, this subtropical jet, with that 80 meter per second rising in here, was a very um, dynamically unstable system, which helped generate that first uh, uh, area of snow. And, um, we're gonna just look at that a little bit. And then on the second phase, uh, this amplifying trough was associated with an incredible uh, tropoporous fold um, that we'll look at. And what's interesting here is, is that at the time, every textbook on tropopor tropoporous folds was that they grew, they developed um, in line, in, uh, coincidentally, with the developing cyclone, not preceding the cyclone. So as part of the forcing debate then, when we look at this subtropical jet, one of the things to note, this is in time, 12Z17, 0Z, 12Z18, that the wavelength is shortening. Here's your geostrophic wind max, the exit region of that wind max, if you were purely 
positive eustrophic would have an AG stroke of 12 from left to right. And yet, when you look at the AG stroke of wind, it's, from, it's completely opposite. And for those who are doing Q vectors, you not only would get the wrong magnitude, you get the wrong sign here. And what it, what's going on when we did these trajectories is that the wind, the parcels are blowing right through this, this axis that doesn't have time from an inertial point of view to make the turn. So it's actually directed towards lower heights again. And the divergence here just exploded. So there are actually people, because there's no trough here, people are actually writing about no upper level force. And here's, here's what happens with that. When you do a cross section, you see this indirect circulation and this rising motion. But right in here is where the coastal front is. And that's where eventually Bob and people like Bob Atlas and Lance Bozart are really made their, made their case. And it uh, turns out they were right, despite my, you know, my protest about uh, how can this be important early on in you know, the diabetic processes that they were looking at. But it turns out that they were right. So I'll say that up front. That takes away the punchline on that one, Bob. Um, uh, with respect to the trophopause fold, I, I pointed out this area here. Um, one of the interesting things about it, you can see quite clearly that with time, this fold was bringing stratospheric air down to about 700 millibars. This was a very intense fold. And one of the things we did was we were actually used Tom's ozone data to map this. You only got this once a day, but it mapped very nicely uh, with where the tropopause fold was. And this was the first application of the Tom's data to a weather system. And when we used the, um, uh, the Sawyer Leeson equation, we did a paper with Dan Kaiser, we could actually show that this frontogenesis uh, aspect, uh, which is a mesoscale feature, was really, uh, this is the, from the analysis and this is from the calculations, we're really working to bring that stratospheric air down. Now, why is this important? Um, you know, Norm Phillips had, um, actually in, in the very first cyclone workshop um, when we were talking about this, uh, looked at Mel Shapiro and said, you know, why should we care about this? After all, we stimulate cyclogenesis with the two layer model. And this was classic Norm Phillips, you know, just provoked the, uh, um, the audience. And uh, the point here is, is that uh, this, you know, this was a really great illustration of how mesoscale processes um, actually then drive the synoptic scale development downstream. So with all that, this is what we were using to uh, actually forecast at the time. Seven, uh, seven layer model, um, just think about that first, and then 127 kilometers uh, for the LFM. This was a big advance. We, as students, we used to hang over the fax machine and wait for this model to come out. I knew how to operate a fax machine because we were not going to miss this model, right? Uh, it was a, but look at this, primary data source rayout data. No significant level data we used in the models. Um, and the research community after this basically said enough is enough. There was mesoscale scale modeling starting in the academic community and, and what this cyclone workshop did was bring these, uh, bring these groups together. And, um, and Bob cranks up the Goddard Laboratory global model with the focus on sensible and um, uh, sensible heat release um, and the diabetic processes associated with this. I should point out that the boundary layer heating was uh, with these rapidly developing cyclones over oceans were usually focused on this process happening after the cyclone form, not before. So this was uh, a unique aspect of this work that uh, Bob wound up doing with the global model. So I'll just point out that um, this is what the LFM looked like uh, 36 hours and 24 hours in advance, some indication even at 12 hours, but this low was moving out like this. So even as this model came out, the forecaster said, you know, drop the warnings. And, um, that was a problem. Okay, so Bob's paper uh, published in 87 in the Dynamics of Atmospheres and Oceans, the role of ocean fluxes in initial data in a numerical prediction of intense coastal storm. Um, this, is his, um, this is his abstract. And um, what's really important here is that looking at the diabetic processes um, resulting from the oceanic flu fluxes, increasing the low level baroclinity, Decreased static stability, that's key. Um, you go back to Eliasson's work and the whole circulation aspect is really enhanced with the decreased uh, static stability. Uh, significantly contributed both to the generation of low level uh, cyclone vorticity 
and the intensification of the slow greater movement of the upper level ridge. So the whole, remember that ridge is, is the wavelength is decreasing, that's because that ridge was not moving, okay? And that's a very important part for the rapid development aspect of this. So um, there's your fluxes, uh, the, the, both the sensible and moisture flux. Very cold air. Remember, this is the coldest air of one of the coldest anticyclones uh, that we've seen in, along the East Coast. And you see these fluxes. Um, and we start, you know, looking at some of the models. This is a global model. What was the horizontal resolution of this? 500 kilometers. Yeah, so don't don't get you know too worked up about this. Um, so, uh, but what what we're showing and what's really important um, is that the importance of sensible light and heat flux, um, you know, in, in locking in. This is the the coastal front phase of of the storm, and then the development itself is is locked in along the coast. So it's certainly uh, pointing towards the uh, importance of the strong upper level forcing oceanic fluxes. Um, what I was, I think what we were debating inside the office at this point was um, whether you could still get this with the dynamical processes if you had a higher resolution uh, model. Um, I should note the temperature difference, very strong temperature difference. This is the delta T full physics minus adiabatic along the coast. So clearly these diabetic processes are having an impact uh, on the system. But I wasn't convinced, and I was still arguing with them, because that's what we do, okay? But we're from New York, right? <laughs> and besides, when we argued, it was nothing like the hallway arguments that were going on between Schuchler and Yehania, all right? <laughs> with Milch just throwing in gasoline just to keep it going. Um, so it, I wouldn't say it was an argument. It was a real healthy debate, but I, you know, I took a, a um, a model with about 35 to 50 kilometer resolution. I don't know the exact uh, one that this is, but when I did the adiabatic run, I went, uh oh. Okay, even with the higher resolution, it was clear that there were things going on here with respect to diabetic processes. And what's interesting is, is that with the boundary layer, no latent heat, we actually got a deeper low, the boundary layer processes in the no latent heat, than we got with the latent heat, no boundary layer. But to get this, you needed a synergistic interaction amongst all this, that the result was greater than the sum of the equal parts with this. So there's clearly a feedback mechanism that was going on here. And it showed up uh, both in the um, initial development phase and the, um, um, the, uh, the rapid development phase. Quickly, uh, one of the reasons I got really interested in, I was always interested in the development of these low-level jets in the uh, lower branch of the indirect circulation. Now, they, remember that cross section for that circulation is right through here. So this low level jet in the, in the uh, full physics run, where the, where the vector, these are um, the velocity following this parcel. You can see this 21 meters per second to 31 as it's crossing the coastline is right in the lower branch of that indirect circulation. But it's also right over the top of the coastal front. And the reason you get this acceleration is the vertical lift, because you're actually seeing a different pressure gradient field and you're getting very rapid acceleration. So this low level jet in the physics run is forming in about two to three hours. It, this has, you know, and this is the whole point of the diabetic processes feeding back into this dynamic signal, is that you really get these rapid accelerations. If you have your adiabatic run, you get some increase, but the parcel doesn't get the lift upward and you basically are holding um, just a constant uh, velocity through. Um, you know, I just look at the differences here between 9Z, 10Z, uh, 11Z, and 12Z. You can see this incredible, uh, here's the total win right here. So you go from here to here to here to here. This is all happening in three hours. And you can see this with the adiabatic flow is related to that vertical lift of the air as it's crossing that front. I thought I discovered the third dimension of the adjustment process, and Don Johnson told me to go look at Newton 1954. These folks in the early 50s, would, just by doing analysis with radius on data and living case studies, had this all figured out. It's amazing. It still amazes me. And if you look at the, uh, we did um, the mass divergence uh, for um, these vertical profiles, mass divergence for three hour periods. And what is interesting here, here's the full physics run, and you can see this low-level mass divergence. This is in the entrance region of that low-level jet where the air is accelerating. That signal 
is related almost entirely within the boundary layer and no way competing. So the boundary layer process, so I've convinced myself, I never told Bob he was right before, but I'm saying it now. Um, and I had, to, I had to do the same mea culpa at uh, Lance Bozart's thing last week. So um, it's there. And if you want the two layer, you get the two layer uh, mass uh, divergence profile with the rapid development phase. But what was interesting here, um, and was news to me was that the level of non-divergence being at 700 millibars, not at so with these rapidly developing systems, you get this low level of um, um, the, the level of zero divergence, and um, but you still get the two-layer uh, process as that uh, trough came in. Now, one way of putting this all together is to look at the video uh, that uh, Bill Hibbert and I and um, Santac and Grill put together. This is actually the first VIS-5D, and I'm going to show the video in a minute. But this is the two um, uh, surface for the uh, potential vorticity. <laughs> these are trajectories, and you see these boundary layer trajectories. Can we cut the lights just um, real quick? While well, we're doing that. So Bill Hibbert was the father of Viz 5D, uh, the system that's used at uh, NCAR. This is the, actually the first, um, and it's only, once we get it going, it's only two or three minutes. So, so here's the uh, vorticity coming across, and here's, here's the boundary processes coming, coming home, is this development of the um, of potential vorticity in this area. And what you'll see when we put the trajectories on top of this is um, the trajectories with the stratospheric extrusion actually move with move with this uh, potential vorticity, but these pass through and out. Okay, and then you see this this conveyor belt that uh, people were writing about come around and wraps around that that vorticity mass. And if you do this with the sea level pressure isobars, it's really neat. Um, this is uh, when Hoskins and McIntyre were writing their paper and sh uh, showed them this. And, you know, it's right, right from there. So it starts off, you got the nice tilt. And then as the psychogenesis occurs, you get the lock, the phase lock, and it goes nearly vertical. So it's there, but you don't get that bottom of uh, potential vorticity without the diabetic processes that. Bob and, um, and Lance Bozart were, were emphasizing. So in summary, um, what I learned from this, everything was on the table for unraveling the mysteries, upper and lower level dynamics, thermodynamics, dynamics, balance constraints, unbalanced flow. Um, synoptic meteorology wasn't dead. We started using model output to actually study the dynamics. Uh, one of the things that's really struck me with all the work I've done with Paul Kostin is that snowstorms really are mesoscale events cloaked in synoptic scale lore, and you saw this here. And, and the mesoscale involves the whole dynamic and physical processes. It's not just one or the other. Um, the time rate of change uh, related to the development cyclogenesis is minutes to hours, not hours. Um, and we really do need to consider the, the, the imbalance that, that is involved here. And um, and I also discovered there's just as much joy in learning about these storms and how they develop as there are in experiencing them. And I got to share this with Bob. Um, it was really, really, really delightful. Um, this is what we did when I left in 89. When did you come down here? 2005. 2005. So I went to the Weather Service. Um, Milt nearly went crazy when I went to the Weather Service, and uh, he tried to talk me out of it. I guess it was a good move, uh, Milt. Uh, <laughs> Um, but we got, in, we got involved in the quick scat debate. Um, I didn't think the sea surface winds alone would, um, would have as much influence on the forecast as they did, but you have to do the pressure adjustment when you put the winds in. But they really were a big deal uh, in our operational models, and Bob was one of the early proponents. I guess Pierre Morel hooked up with you, and um, Bob does a great 10-minute brief. He can convince an administrator on anything in 10 minutes. It's amazing watching him. Um, NASA NOAA Joint Center for Satellite Data Assimilation, he stepped in uh, to help get that off the ground uh, and get the errors assessment. That was the first thing we worked on. And of course, down here, we already heard about the HWARF work that goes on jointly um, between here and EMC, and also the interactions on the aircraft uh, uh, is really incredibly important for what we do. 
So I want to thank you, first of all, for inviting me into your office. The way I hear the story is that you actually told Milton it was okay all right, to invite somebody from a different branch uh, down to the ground floor and share an office with you. So, um, and thank for allowing me to be part of your career journey. Um, I, you've made a, a difference uh, for the larger research and operational communities. Uh, and I really uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louie, and uh, a special thank you from me for keeping in 30 minutes. That's incredible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, to Katie. Uh, fabulous. So while I, <laughs> um, in order to keep us on schedule, because we want to have time to hear from everybody, we have one more speaker, uh, Dr. Frank Bark from the London Coffee Break. So I'm going to invite Frank up while I get his presentation ready. <laughs> Thanks, Erica. First of all, I want to say uh, I did see a lot of these debates when I was uh, finishing up grad school. I remember one conference in Albany, a forecasting conference, and uh, this debate breaks on. And of course, I was working with lands on coastal fronts while I was at MIT. So um, it's it's a pleasure to still be in part of that. Um, so officially, Frank Marks, director of the Hurricane Research Division, one of our three science divisions at A1L. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Erica. Um, and thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, I know Bob likes to hear about the things he did, but I wanted to also talk a little bit about where we're going. And, and really, uh, I want to do that because Bob has been a catalyst for a lot of the changes that have happened in hurricane research over the last decade, at least. Um, so I want to start with some of the accomplishments and advances since Bob arrived. Now, Bob arrived right after Katrina, or I think just before just Katrina. Before. Just before Katrina, and he was sitting in a hotel with his family while Katrina raged on by the airport. Um, and so he arrived at a kind of auspicious time. In 2004, when he was applying for the job, we had five US landfalls. Then the year he arrives, we have three more. Uh, in Katrina, Rita, and Wilma. Uh, and Admiral Lautenbacher was the uh, administrator at the time, and he said, what the hell's going on? You know, why, why are we not getting these forecasts so good? And I know there was a lot of consternation about it. And uh, HRD at the time, um, we were doing a lot of observation stuff. Uh, we were involved with partnerships with NASA. We had partnerships with NSF. We were collecting a lot of observations. Um, we weren't really doing any modeling work anymore. We hadn't been doing a lot of work in the operational systems. Um, but we had been collecting all this wonderful data and characterizing what we knew about a hurricane. Uh, and that, I think, uh, when Bob showed up, he felt very strongly and resonated with me that we needed a more balanced uh, division. We needed to be more involved with the different aspects. So. As Bob arrived, H. Worf came online um, in 2007. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, Admiral Lumpbecker was very concerned about what was going on. And he asked the NOAA Science Advisory Board to commission a, a, a working group uh, to evaluate what we needed to do to do better. Now, Louie and I go way back because we had fought the USWRP wars and tried to get hurricanes at landfall uh, into the USWRP. So we had a lot of material, uh, but we had this impetus from Admiral Lautenbacher. I remember sitting in Bob's office with Dave Atlas, Bob Atlas, uh, uh, Admiral Lautenbacher, uh, D.L. Johnson, talking about how we could make this happen. Uh, this happened on, again, one of our auspicious moments of the 50th anniversary of the National Hurricane Research Project was in 2006. We had all these people sitting there, and then the Hurry Report comes out. Uh, and then there's a recommendation. There's 34 recommendations that we have to do this, this, and that. Higher resolution model, more data simulation, get the observations in. And NOAA was, you know, trying to figure out how we were going to do with anything. And uh, Bob came up to me. They went to some summit where all of you people were talking about how we should deal with this. Uh, and he said, Frank, I think we need to take the lead here. Would you be willing to do it? 
uh, and that was kind of where HFIP was born. Um, we finally got a supplemental in 09 to kick us off. Um, out of that, Gopal came in 2007 or 8. Um, we started working uh, in parallel with NHC on a higher resolution ver version of HWARF that had three moving nests instead of two. Um, that was HWARF X. In 2012, we merged those, became HWARF operational with three nests. Um, at three kilometer resolution, then we pushed the two kilometer resolution, then we talked about a basin scale, how do we get more um, structure in the storm, uh, uh, interactions of multiple storms instead of storm following, and now we're currently at one and a half kilometer resolution. Um, HMON came on. Uh, that came out of an interaction between uh, HRD and EMC and looking at the NG, uh, what, what's it called? The, the, the NAM model, basically, we were going to use that core for the hurricane. Uh, and now we're kind of on, uh, and then Bob also said, hey, we need to better use the data. And so he started CLOSAP, the Quantitative Observing System Assessment Program, which we, HRD got involved with, and Ross Hoffman came on board, and Lydia Kukaral and, and Tommy Mukicevic. Um, and data assimilation became important. And now we have a pretty uh, potent group of researchers now at HRD, thanks to Bob's impetus uh, to work more balanced across the, the spectrum of research. And so with FEGFS coming online, thanks to GFPL transitioning to the weather service, <clears throat> that red arrow says we're poised to move on to the next step. Uh, Bob has been instrumental in making us a bit ready now to really move on. Uh, and so I think it's known now that HWARP is probably one of the best hurricane forecast systems we have, uh, but we're ready to move to the next step. Um, so the Weather Act uh, was passed in 2017 uh, with new goals. They wanted us to continue HFIP but they wanted to change our focus a bit. They wanted us to continue to improve prediction of rapid intensification and track. Don't stop doing that. Uh, improve forecast and communication of storm surge and hazards risk, and then incorporate risk communication. That was a biggie. How do we do that? Engaging social and behavioral sciences and their research into the mix. And obviously, even though I mentioned HWARF is such a good model, just last year with Florence and Michael, we see there's still a big need uh, for improvement. So we formed a team. Uh, the OER was tasked. Uh, Bob got me tasked again to prepare uh, a plan for Congress on how we move forward. And so that's really what I'm going to talk about. Uh, we formed a nice team from the Hurricane Center, EMC, GFDL, AOML, um, and uh, other areas. We had some uh, operational forecasters uh, from, the Hurt, uh, from Miami office, uh, and we put together a new plan. We have new goals. We've updated the HFIP goals, continuing to reduce forecast errors, including during rapid intensification by 50% from 2017. That's a pretty tough sell, uh, or it's going to be a, a, a a real goal to challenge us. Uh, produce seven-day forecast guidance as good as current day five-day forecast guidance. Um, and that's not just track, that's everything. Uh, improve guidance on preformation. We don't use the word genesis because genesis is kind of a nebulous type of thing, but preformation. Now the Weather Service has to put out warnings and watches uh, prior to an event particularly in the islands. Uh, if you have a rapid intensification system right on the islands, you want to get the watches in the morning up early. So they really want guidance on the timing, the track and intensity forecast right away. Uh, and then to prove, improve hazard guidance and risk communication based on social and behavioral science and modernize the products for all hazards. Uh, we're talking about not just wind, but rainfall, uh, severe weather, surge, so uh, we developed research priorities. Uh, the key one is to develop a hurricane analysis and forecast system. 
And we felt that analysis, as Louis was pointing out, analysis is critical. If you don't have a good understanding of the state that you're in at the time, um, you're not going to have a great prediction. Uh, and even with our ensembling systems, uh, you need to have a good initial state. Uh, we felt that having that bridge of analysis and forecasting together, working as a team, you can find those biases quicker. You can see where the model and the OBS differ quite rapidly if you have a good analysis. So that we felt DA had to be a major emphasis here as well as physical processes, which we've always done with our model developments, better boundary layers, better convection, better uh, microphysics, radiation. Um, the other uh, big one was to develop probabilistic hazard guidance. We've been using probabilistic guidance for track and intensity. Uh, we have the wind speed probabilities. The Hurricane Center has many products that are, use probabilistic information, but a lot of that is informed by past events. Um, you know, the average errors or the average uncertainty that we have in our forecast, not on the specific event. Uh, we wanted to advance the ensemble guidance post-processing. What is the information that we have to, this is machine learning, maybe even artificial intelligence. How do we extract the essential information out of the forecast? and then use that information to uh, guide our uncertainty in our probabilistic hazard models and products. And then of course, enhance communications, uh, evaluate and modernize products for effective communication of risk. Um, that's a challenge. And I think it's gonna be a real challenge for us as physical scientists, as we engage and work more with the social and behavioral scientists to understand we tend to produce products that make sense to us as physical scientists. And yet somebody outside who's not looks at it and says, what does that mean? You know, I don't understand what that color, that color did. Why is that arrow going this way and that way? What is a watch? What is a warning? They mean something to us, but they may not mean something to the public or to somebody else. So how do we develop hats? I look at it uh, the way I look at HRD. We have a three-legged stool. Uh, we have observations, aircrafts, and satellite. We have models, HWAR, paths. Uh, we have an analysis system. We have GSI or, or uh, some ensemble DA system, hybrid system. Uh, JEDI now, I guess, is the new term that everybody's banding about. All of those feed together towards the understanding and prediction. So you have your satellites and your aircraft collecting OBS, you're putting that data into the model for the forecast, uh, but it's the interaction at the bottom there, the observing system strategies, what COSAP is doing, the evaluation of observational analyses, looking at the model and how it interacts. Um, and then from that comes your understanding and prediction. We've kind of cobbled this together, this tool together uh, over time. But the goal is for the new HFIP is to try and take advantage of all those pieces and move them forward. Uh, so right now, in the top left, we have HWARD. That's a really good model system. Um, HFIP has worked tirelessly for the last 10 years to make HWARD as good as we've made it. Uh, are we fully successful? Probably not. We have a long ways to go but we're now starting to transition. And so the beginning of that transition, about four or five years ago, H4, we put in the basin scale H4, which allowed us to not have a storm centric system, but have a fixed outer domain with multiple storms interacting inside of it. Sort of a bridge to where we wanna go for hats. Uh, how do we take the hurricane and move it from just itself to the global system? And so the vision we have is to take the FEGFS, and I want to thank Bill Ramstrom and the, and the modeling team for putting this great graphic together. Um, this actually is the global model output where we're simulating what we would want to do with the nesting. We have uh, multiple storms going on globally. We want to be able to put these moving nests where we need them to have the hurricane uh, forecast have highest resolution we can get so that we can get the scale. Um, so that's where we're going with HAS. Um, 
The other thing is we need the DA to come along with us. We've been working over the last few years to improve the getting the aircraft and satellite data into H4. There's going to be a challenge as we move. This is uh, Michael from last year. We're bringing in the Doppler data. We're getting the forecast out from H4 with the data going in. The challenge we have now is making better use of satellite odds. Uh, satellites don't really look well, do well inside the hurricane core because of all the clouds. Uh, but we need to take advantage of that where it isn't there and to combine and blend the different data sources, aircraft and satellite together to get the best mix of odds. But the data assimilation system cannot chase the modeling. It has to be in phase. They have to be working in sync because the analysis is going to inform us about errors in the model as we move forward. Um, other thing, new observations. We have tremendous amount of new observations we're looking at. We've traditionally looked at drop sounds. Uh, now we're looking at the tail Doppler radar. We have, thanks to Bob, a Doppler wind radar. Finally, we're actually making ops. Uh, we have a brand new lower fuselage radar that gives us multi-mode so that we can look at not only the rainfall, but we can look at the sea state. And it also is Dopplerized. We have other instruments like a wide scanning radar altimeter, which is, gives us the 2D wave field. We have an IRAP uh, that Paul Chang has been uh, working with as a scatterometer, as well as a profiler, giving us wind uh, estimates in the vertical, as well as the surface wind. We have small unmanned aerial systems, such as the Coyote, we have a, a sub-frequency microwave radiometer, which is actually measuring the surface or estimating the surface wind directly from the spray. And now we have GOES-16 and 17 and NOAA-20 and uh, NTP out there with all these new uh, sensors that we have to start bringing into the model. So Bob has uh, also helped us with this development of our OSC OSI technology as part of CROSAP. Uh, we've been able, he's been pushed us to develop nature runs. This is actually in a partnership with uh, Rasmus, uh, developing a high resolution nature run of a hurricane, the first one uh, with Dave Nolan. Uh, this is the one kilometer output. And so the way that OSI works, we take that high resolution information in the nest plus the outer domain, and we use that to make synthetic observations such as the satellite, uh, synthetic satellite imagery. And then we can put that into the hurricane model, the H4, uh, with a DA system. And, sim and because we know the nature, the truth, we can then evaluate how well those OBS affect the forecast. So we have a way of doing trade-offs and cost-benefit analysis. And this is really Bob's baby. Um, uh, I think it, I like it because it's really increased our ability to understand our observing. Uh, and the strengths of our different observing systems. It has also built up a huge capacity for data simulation work at the lab and people who understand the data uh, better. So it, it marries our data observational rich history with the modeling much better. And that's why I really like the data simulation because it kind of bridges that gap. Without that third leg in the stool, uh, you really don't stand up well. Uh, and so the other thing is physics, horizontal diffus diff diffusivity. HRD has such a body of observational evidence of what's going on in the hurricane. Uh, this is just a simple plot of the impact of changing the horizontal diffusion to better match what we observe. The model had a certain diffusivity. It was much higher than what we observed in the storms. When we changed that, all of a sudden the forecast got much better. Same thing happened with vertical diffusivity in the boundary layer. So the benefit of having these people who understand the data, the characterization of the vortex, and its structure together with the modeling, uh, this was a marriage of Gopal and Jason Sippel and Jun Zhang, uh, observationalist, a data simulation person, and a modeler, working together in the same group and talking the same language that made these things possible. So lessons learned from our research in the past and our challenges ahead. Model improvements must be in sync with DA. I'm convinced of that. DA helps identify model biases related to physics. Vortex spin down was a problem we had in high initial intensity cases affects DA, reducing the observation impact. Better analysis means better model and DA. 
challenges. Incorporating a moving nest and an inner core DA into this global system is going to be a big challenge. Uh, make better use of satellite observations. We need to address microphysics and radiative uh, transfer bias in the physics. Uh, DA systems need to address the high temporal and spatial resolution of these satellite systems. Right now we're cycling six hourly. The observations are coming in every five, 10 minutes. You know, we're not even close to tapping that kind of information research. Develop probabilistic hazard guidance. <clears throat> I want to just give an example. This came from our, our work with the Hurricane Center folks who've done this. Track matters for surge. This is Hurricane Michael. If the, you take the observed track, you get one surge. You see it's all focused right around the, uh, Appalach the, the Appalachian Peninsula there, the mouth of the Appalachian River in Mexico Beach. But if you looked at the forecast track a little earlier, you have a whole different scenario. So a small difference in track makes a huge difference in the impact, not only in surge, but in wind and in rainfall. Um, so what are we doing right now? What the Hurricane Center is doing right now is they're trying to use uh, P-Surge, which is a probabilistic hazard guidance. This is the GFS ensemble for that same forecast time. This is the ECMWF forecast. So you see we have some pretty good uncertainty in track information here. What do they use at surge? They're using P-surge. They're taking a statistical approach. Instead of using the model ensembles, they're using a statistical approach around the, observe, uh, the forecast track that the hurricane center produces, and they're perturbing it in different directions based on a climatological or, or historical era of track. Uh, and then producing a probabilistic uh, event. Now, there's a couple things with that. This P-surge model, uh, in the bottom there, I'm showing the P-surge initial RMW versus the observed RMW. You see that P-surge is based on climatology. It has a certain radius of maximum winds, has a certain peak wind distribution that is taken from our past, whereas the model or the observations are different. And we're not taking advantage of that information. So the idea is, and I'm just giving a simple example here because we haven't done it, we could use the model guidance to perturb the radii that go into the P-Search model. We could not only use the track ensemble, but we could use the ensemble of the forecast radii, peak winds, and inform the forecast more towards that storm rather than a climatological mean. So lessons learned, currently the uncertainty in TC Heiser guidance is expressed based on past performance, not on current forecast uncertainty. Our challenge is we wanna use the facets framework to transform our hazard guidance, blending our social and behavioral uh, science research and our physical science R&D. We wanna improve the probabilistic hazard guidance utilizing model uncertainty uh, and improve the communication of risk uh, through social and behavioral science research. So an idea here, uh, enhancing communication of risk uncertainty. This I stole from uh, Louis' group uh, that work uh, on the HAS-SIM uh, on how we can take information from our guidance that we develop right now and translate it into information that the community or the emergency managers can use. This is a challenge uh, in the sense that the way we think about things, we're very spatially oriented, we're very physically based, yet people have a lot of gray area in all those issues. Uh, and their interpretation of what we say is different, and we need to take advantage of that as we move forward. Um, example, this is from Sandy. These are your New York City evacuation zones uh, based on category of the storm. This is the Cat 4 high tide anomaly uh, overlaid over those. And so you can start to see how maybe you can start taking this information and providing better guidance on evacuation, all sorts of different pieces of information. Uh, this is just an example. I think the Hurricane Center is really leading the, the way here with their work on the new surge product that came out of our uh, changing the Stafford Simpson scale. And I think we have to continue on that path uh, to make uh, HVIP and our hurricane guidance products better. 
So in summary, uh, the 2017 Weather Research Forecast Act calls for an h -dip renewal. Uh, we want to improve the prediction of RN track, improve forecast com and communications of storm surge and other hazards, incorporation of risk communication research to create more effective products. Current products, metrics, and verifications fall short of those needed to support the weather. <clears throat> research must expand to address all impacts from hurricanes, wind surge, inland flooding, severe weather, and incorporate risk communication research and to create more effective products. Uh, and in closing, I want to thank Bob, one, for being a great boss and a good friend, um, and for setting the stage for us to be able to step out. Um, when you come back the next time, uh, don't recommend me for another task here. <laughs> uh, I can say the last uh, 15 years, 16 years has been a blast, and thank you so much for everything uh, you've done for our HRD, OML, and our careers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. We do have a couple of minutes before we're scheduled to take our first break of the morning. Are there any questions of either Frank or Lou, your first two speakers? Sam, you're loud. You can speak. And if I could just ask, we'll just read. So, Frank, you're looking at the possibility of a cast forward in New York? That's highly unlikely, but interesting. I'm not looking for it. I'm thinking uh, that was a good example of how desperate we are. Frank. But it won't take a gap for you that kind of book. As we found out with Sandy, uh, if that storm had been 10 miles further north, uh, it would have been, I don't know how we're ranking the search yet, but I think the history of that storm and its track um, in the high pressure systems of the Northeast, uh, there was a, a, a devastation would have carried the north. Well, and actually, I think that em it actually emphasizes the point I was trying to make about our communication. It does not take that four to do that kind of damage in New York City. I mean, uh, we've, we've uh, uh, you know, we've associated categories with hazards way too much. We have to kind of, hazards are very different than just related to category, I think is the point. It's uh, the size of the storm. Um, how fast it's moving, what the area is like, you know, how much track deviation you get. I have another question I have for you. If you were using today's state of the art modeling forecasting this year, how good do you think we would forecast that the small storm? The, um, that's actually good. Yeah, yeah, are you yeah. doing it now? Yeah, well, we are. Well, let's put it this way. Um, I think. One of the biggest challenges we face is that people assume that either when you miss a storm, you're going to miss them all, or that when you hit a storm, you're going to hit them all. So we, I keep on emphasizing the predictability issues with these uh, storms. We've had storms that we predicted uh, five, six, seven, eight days in advance. And last year, we had two storms that 24 hours before the storm, we not only uh, didn't know the, what the track was going to be, we didn't know what the precip was going to be, over 50 million people, 24 hours before the storm. Uh, people have gone back using the reanalysis to uh, forecast uh, the 79 storm, and it is it is predictable. Um, I know the 19 people have used reanalysis back in 1950 to show the very first cyclone that was used by Norm Phillips and others to show that numerical modeling could actually work. That with the radio sign network that went into place in 19. Uh, um, uh, 1950, they, they actually re-ran the storm with the high resolution global models we have today predicted five days in advance. And that was a historic storm. So, you know, you can do it, uh, but I can tell you in real time, um, those are, you know, when you don't have the chance to fine tune or go correct that observation or re you know, do the use of reanalysis that really, um, I would claim that the predictability issues are still significant. And, and that the only way I feel comfortable in predicting further out is to use the ensemble approach. Yeah, and I, I would actually suggest that the same kind of uh, sensitivity I showed from the hurricane on the hazards is equally with the winter storm, the, the heavy snowstorms. I mean, you know, 
I studied coastal fronts. If you were on one side of the coastal front, you had the rain. The other side, you had the heaviest snow you could imagine. And they were only 50 miles apart. And if the coastal front doesn't form, you have a totally different event. One more question. <clears throat> If I, if I may just make a comment with respect to hurricane at landfall and, and in the HFIP, uh, I was the co-lead of the U.S. Weather Research Program, and I remember very clearly, like nine proposals. We, we only had money for one, doing one thing after like eight years of preparation. This was not the climate research program, okay? No, it wasn't. It was, and the reason that hurricane at landfall was selected, um, I think, and Rappaport was probably working with Frank on this, but they actually came to the table and started with societal impacts and how a better track forecast and intensity forecast would affect that, how science was needed to improve those, how observation. Everybody else just came in and said basically throw money at us and somehow we'll, we'll make it work. Mm -hmm. And they included the operational. It was like a no brainer on, on the hurricane at landfall. That, so, you know, the tornado folks were all kind of ticked off that we just focused on hurricanes, but he's the guy who came in and made that presentation. On HFIP, um, Scott Rader was sort of orchestrating this behind the scenes, and um, they were putting together the, uh, um, the Hurricane Forecast Improvement Program with all the input that you said. But it took one last meeting, and it was in the Vice President's office, and they... Uh, and Scott, like, I'll let you say that Yeah, one. yeah. So Scott... You were there. Yes. Um, Scott called me up. I was on vacation and said, We need you back here on Monday morning, 7 30 in the Vice President's office, Valley I teach that. And um, why, the reason it was so contentious was that it was actually in July to change the budget for 08. For, oh, yeah, for the next, for that year, which is never done. And we got it done. His input is what I was using uh, to not only make the case, but the uh, to um, answer the question. Um, so it was really, um, really delightful, and we used the experience from uh, from the hurricane of landfall to prove that we could actually get the result done that would impact society. So that was so for you, for you folks who are writing proposals and all that, it's not a random walk anymore that's selling these programs. You got to come back to societal, or even start with societal impact, and then work your way back through the various issues. And it was clearly laid out uh, again for the uh, for the. Can I just answer Ronnie's question? One step further. I suppose amnesty must be moving very high in those grades. Why cannot we apply to the first one? That's a good question. Uh, why yeah. should that be a big effort? Well, the uh, part of the reason, and, and in fact, I would argue that the hurricane folks would like to have a bigger box too. Yeah, yeah. Way is that the interactions amongst, you know, the, the, the thing with extratropical cyclones could be three troughs coming together um, that happen for over a three-day period, and then the cyclone itself forms in 12 hours and goes off, whereas where you have this well-defined hurricane moving across the Atlantic, you can actually define that box a lot better than you can for an extratropical it's cyclone. Harder, but then it made it now, uh, in some cases, it's you're going to have a box that's, Basically, from Greenland to uh, to California, uh, even two days to, in advance. Thank you all very much. We're going to go into a 15 minute break. We'll have our next speaker at the podium at 10:45. Please keep on. If you would like a copy of the final agenda, we'll include one additional no, speaker. We have copies of the agenda up here. I'll see you back at 10:45. Thank you, Professor Shukla. Professor Shukla. Yes, from uh, George Mason University. It's so nice to be here, Bob. Uh, and Bob didn't have to body slam me like me. <laughs> uh, uh, once I heard, uh, in fact, I came for his retirement point. I, <laughs> I was here <laughs> last month, and Ben Kurtzman took such good care of me. I said, I'll go again. Uh, <laughs> uh, but actually, uh, uh, it's such a pleasure, uh, Bob and Shirley. Uh, uh, we have been such a good friend, Anne and I, and so I thought that this is a, a good opportunity. Uh, when I heard uh, Eugenia is going to be here, and then I later heard, even Mills may be here, I said, this is fantastic. I think one just has to come, because what I was going to talk about is really uh, what happened 40 years ago, 45 years ago. Okay, so back actually, Bob and I both 
came to God at around 1978. That's, uh, I, I, uh, uh, I came through this MIT NASA connection where uh, Mark and I and Michael Gill were given this part-time appointment, thanks to Milt. Uh, and uh, so I thought that uh, this will be wonderful, and especially if Indian is here, Milt is here, and there are certain things I'm going to say. So in addition to you, I'm really also going to engage them because I want to paint a picture, see what's, what's the situation. So this is 1978, okay? At Goddard, as uh, Louis said, there is a Mills Palace. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's basically, it's a very nice office space. It's an open space. Mills office is on the one side, the biggest office. Uh, the uh, Bob's office, as Bob told me, he was in G38. My office was like one door down, I think house one was in the middle. Eugenia's office was on the, around the corner. And uh, I think that uh, uh, we really had a lot of fun. So the conversations and decisions, and uh, there was one thing very clear. Uh, by the way, I, I think Ross Hoffman came. I, I know, I, I see a lot of people who were there high in their, uh, this thing. So it was very clear uh, whether you are Mills people or you are the other people. You know, it was very clear. Okay, okay. okay. No, 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 no. You took away my sunshine. You would start with first the other guys, you know. He was part of the other guys. Uh, but later on, then he was invited <laughs> okay. uh, in this. And by the way, it's such a fun to be Mills people. Let me just tell you. I just still remember Mills one day firing off a letter to Meredith, who was the head of the division, asking for appointment of Eugenia Colony and they supply GS-15. Just the first request. <laughs> and they just uh, threw that back and said, what are you talking about? So on. And one of them was not a serious. Anyway. Milt, I, I really took this opportunity when I heard you that to thank you guys. So I thought that what it is that I should talk about. And uh, Louis Cellini's talk was really sort of think about that, except that rather than going to an event or a storm, what I'm going to talk about is that what were the ideas that we were all arguing about, we were thinking about? What are the ideas that actually came out during those four or five years? And uh, actually, when I tell you the history, hopefully you'll be surprised. Oh, really? That's how it all came about? Because some of those ideas has actually come and actually become quite important for our field, uh, both for weather forecasting and climate forecasting. So just imagine the, 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 the scenario. So the three ideas I'm going to talk about, this is give me a 10 minute warning in case I keep talking because uh, by the way, there's a great advantage of not having PowerPoint. You can change your talk all the way to the last moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's, <laughs> so, that's, so that's why I was just hearing Mill telling her, uh, I'm changing my talk. Well, <laughs> you, because you have PowerPoint, so you have to take somebody's help in changing your talk. Uh, anyway, uh, the three stories I'm going to tell you. First one is about land. Nobody has heard about land. Let me just tell you, just about land. And the last conversation actually became very important because if you have an extremely high resolution model to predict the evolution of the snowstorms, you really have to deal with extremely high resolution land at the boundary layer and, at this, and you have the land and ocean. But the idea that I want to talk about land was that, you know, this is 1978. Land was not considered very important, uh, just in general. Uh, you know, I mean, Manabe had done the bucket model, and just for the climate modelers, we're just doing on that. And if you look at the history, you have National Center for Atmospheric Research. Why? 65 years ago. Atmosphere, that's what we're interested in. Then we came to Institute for Study of Ocean and Atmosphere, and look at all these departments where atmosphere and ocean. So in some way, some of the things that happened during those five years really led to the idea of having a center where land becomes an important. And I think that, the, that that was something that uh, it, it became very clear. And, uh, and, and thanks to Milt, and thanks to this whole group, I have to bring one more person into the picture to explain the land. Jul Charney and Yale Mint. So Jul Charney had done an experiment on the, when you guys were in New York, about the albedo effect of the, uh, of the uh, 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 sort of Sahel drought. 
And uh, Jun Chani, uh, and I was a graduate student, and Mil, I mean, uh, uh, Mint was visiting, and he wrote his draft, and he gave it to me, read it as a proofread. And I read it, and it was terrible in Ethan. But who is going to tell that to Chani? So I told Yell, Yell, this is a terrible draft. What should I do? And Yell read it, and he said, this is written the way he talks in the classes. <laughs> so anyway, finally we collected enough courage and we told him what he had done, that he had changed it. The paper was effect of albedo. But if you go inside the paper, it was all about the impact of solvent. And almost all the results he got was because he had changed the experiments of the solvent. And based on that, by the time we moved to glass, uh, by the way, we also got a lot of modeling and simulation facility. Milk didn't want her to be branch. Everybody is branch. Milk was facility. Just remember that. G GMSF. Uh, and uh, we got a lot of computer time, and we managed to do this experiment where we changed the whole world into a parking lot and the whole world into a swamp ocean. And that was unbelievable impact of land. 30 degree difference in the temperature. And in some way, I think that this whole idea that land has to be taken very seriously for both weather prediction and also for uh, uh, climate prediction began to grow. And if I, and by the way, in each case, I'll just make one comment about so where we are now and what we think we should do now. So what is the current consensus about the land? I think that initial conditions, the one you heard about, atmospheric dynamics is definitely the most important factor for the first five, seven, maybe 110 days. But the land atmosphere interaction is going to be very critical to be able to do now between seven days to 15 days, at least up to a month. And then the ocean takes over, and then we have to have the ocean atmosphere interaction that we must do after that. So, and I mean, if you don't do the land very well, even if you have a very strong El Nino, how it affects US is going to depend upon how the local land is interacting with the atmosphere to modulate the remote effect of El Nino. So I really wanted to just uh, emphasize that we were recognizing, and then we found out something very, uh, and I was just thinking about this meeting, and I said, you know, you have an AOMIA MML, Atlantic, and you have a Pacific. Where is the NOAA lab for US? Why we don't have a major lab which just does US land? And then I realized I found the answer. Well, the Department of Interior is in charge. Geological Survey of India, uh, geological, uh, US Geological Survey is in charge, right? I use all the time geotech. So here is our problem. And I just wanted to make sure that we recognize that take the uh, moisture balance equation, then one term is done by NOAA. One term is done by uh, Geological Survey, and one term is done by Department of Interior. So I just wanted to leave that, as I say, in each case, I'm just going to leave one particular point for you guys to think about, especially that Lou Cellini is here, uh, and Noah uh, the Brass. I really think we have to do something. I mean, right now, we know so much about what's going over the ocean, but we don't know what's going over, uh, over land. I mean, when the soil wet, soil wetness measurement uh, that uh, you know we have, of course, NASA is doing uh, and NOAA are doing a, 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 a great job of trying to initialize. But I just want you to know that till now we have far more difficulty in initializing the land. If you look at the systematic error of the NSF forecast model, CFS V2, you have huge error over land, much larger than you can get anywhere. Anyway. So I just wanted to tell you that the whole idea of land, we started actually talking about it uh, uh, during the same period uh, into that. And I just wanted to end with that. Uh, the second uh, story I want to tell you is about uh, predicting beyond weather. So we have been talking about predicting the weather today. Now, I still remember that the only person that we could find who was willing to talk about it, who passed away, unfortunately, Kiku Miyakoda, a, G G a, G a GFDL. Uh, Kiku was the only one, there was basically nobody interested. This is 77, 78, okay? That there is any predictability beyond 10 days, 15 days. 
uh, there was this whole idea of uh, predictability beyond weather. And uh, this is something I wanted to acknowledge while Bob and Yvenia and Milt were actually doing weather. And this is, a, I was very privileged to be with them. And they were interested in individual events, individual cyclones. Of course, their main interest was to really demonstrate that the satellite data is very important for improving the forecast. And, and I think Bob made a big, big impact on that. We're always, uh, and of course, we know in hindsight now that the major breakthrough in weather prediction came only after we knew how to really assimilate the radiances and have the advanced ensemble Connor filter or 4D power, you know, assimilation system. But the idea that things are actually predictable, and every time uh, Bob will be showing, he, what's the good about that? Bob is looking at actual weather map. You can just see, he just, he talks to the weather phenomena. He just looks at, he will be telling, look, is it moving there, is it moving there. And there is a, I always felt just by looking at what's going on that things are actually much better predicted if you just simply don't look at a particular phenomena, just look at the overall planetary scale. They are very, very, very large. And uh, I was not very comfortable also with the butterfly effect because all my life I have seen the monsoon droughts persist for like whole season. So the, we started thinking about why not we look at the predictability of just the planetary wave uh, rather than just the very strong bioclinic instabilities. And sure enough, uh, when you look at the error growth rate of just the planetary wave, they were far more predictable than the synoptic field instability, which makes sense if you just think about it. It's just that it was not calculated. So I think that the uh, idea that you can actually predict beyond weather, and of course, uh, Milt uh, always was very supportive of it because Milt always wanted to do something which is different uh, from uh, all the other guys that were doing in NASA. So I still remember I showed him a, a slide, you know, one of those old time uh, plastic vibras, and I wrote NWP, and that's what Milt and Eugenia and Bob were doing. And below that, I wrote NCP, numerical climate prediction. And almost everybody went, what? What do you mean? There's no numerical climate prediction. Milk says, great, let's do it. <laughs> I mean, this is a, you need that kind of combination. By the way, let me just tell you, that's how much was real uh, sort of uh, 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 skepticism that anything is predictable beyond weather. Uh, uh, World WMO, w, just now the World Climate Program was launched because uh, the global program has been finished and they wanted to have a, a conference in Leningrad uh, and they were looking for a title. Uh, we were sort of involved with this and we were so excited about what was going on with the work with Charney and with the work on the effect of the boundary conditions. We said, why don't you do a conference on uh, Climate prediction, dynamical climate prediction. Oh, no, 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 no. This is no, absolutely not. In fact, if you say that you are going to do climate prediction in 1970, you will not be invited to many of the meetings. Uh, NCAR had a big uh, workshop on low frequency variability, and the papers that were given that ocean temperature is maybe responsible for that. No, it was rejected. So that is how, by the way, the WMO finally agreed to have a conference called Physical Basis. 10 minutes, physical basis for climate prediction. That is how sort of uh, difficult it was. There was no MF, there were no couple models. By the way, Cola itself, we didn't have no couple models till Ben Kirkman came and he coupled the anomaly with what we are called anomaly couple model that, uh, that uh, uh, Ben had. So anyway, I just wanted to uh, bring that point because this now we are in a seamless prediction, okay, age. So there's not really a separation, but there's certainly, definitely a huge possibility of being able to do the, 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 the prediction uh, on the, uh, and I think that uh, it, it, I'll, I'll, after the third story that I'm telling you, I'll come back to that. And the third story I'm going to tell you is really something that I was originally planning to talk about reanalysis. You all know reanalysis. It becomes such a major thing. And I wanted organizers to put me before you here just to celebrate her work on reanalysis because I'll follow. 
And, uh, but you will be surprised if you hear the story of what really happened about the new hospital. NASA had a program called Global Habitability. How many of you remember that? Global Habitability. Yeah, three people. <laughs> and they came and asked every center, do you have any ideas about Global Habitability? And this is the point where I really want to publicly thank Milt, Eugenia, and Bob. Because they were doing data assimilation. I didn't do any data assimilation at all. But I was listening to their conversation day after day. They are doing this. Oh, we're going to do site no set calculation. They will do site no set, was a very popular assimilation method that you guys were doing. And I was just listening day after day, and I said, you know, this global habitability problem, what if we tell them, and ask Milt and Irina, and that why not we make a proposal that we'll reanalyze the past 10 years of data? That's it. We're ready. Nobody was using the word reanalysis. We're saying retrospective analysis. We sent it to NASA, and uh, it was a good proposal. Everybody forgot about it. So then came Jay Fine, and Jay Fine was made in charge of the NSF climate program. And he said, you know, 3D data is there. How are you going to manage the 3D data? Maybe we need to go and reanalyze the 3D data. So he called me, and I said, look, NASA has a program, and we're saying, but nobody pays attention to it. Then Toga came around, and then Toga was looking for a method how to manage TOGA data. So that gave the platform and then TOGA panel, we put forward this idea that we must reanalyze the past 10 years. Well, let me tell you, to cut, the, I still have a few minutes. Let me just tell you the reaction. Nobody has absolutely any interest in reanalysis. Here's five comments. Good idea, but who's crazy enough to do it? That was the first reaction. Who's crazy enough to do it? Second one. Collecting and cleaning old data set is not an exciting science project. I don't think they want it. Third one, they worried to do that. Oh, by the way, I went to NSA, tried to convince uh, Bonner, I think it was, can you do some reanalysis? And he or someone told me, no, 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 we don't go in the past, we have to go in the future. So they're not interested. <laughs> then I flew to European Center, talked to Benson. I said, can you do some reanalysis? And he got very excited, but his people, both Hollingsworth and Burry, totally against it. They said, no. And Burry said, you know, if we have to do it, we have to do it on the ground floor of the office building. And I didn't know what was his joke. He said, what do you mean ground floor? He said, because if you do on the upper floor, then the rooms don't have to have windows. He thought people who do analysis will jump off the window. <laughs> it will be so, so boring. I'm telling you, it was his reaction, okay? Uh, and there were some good scientific problems also, and they basically, one person said, NWP has not improved at all. All we have done is increase resolution. So why do it now? Let's wait till the model gets better. And there was one good comment. If the, if the variables we can get, large scale variables will be better. But what about fluxes? What about the diabetic heat? What about the other things? And uh, you can always freeze the model, take the today's model. What about the observing system? You cannot free the observing system. That keeps changing. There was one comment that I will come to uh, 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 in the event, but let me just tell you uh, uh, that it was a absolutely challenge to convince people. And if I can take some credit for Cola, Cola has the ability to do a credible threat and say, we'll do it. And we did it for 18 months by using the NSEP model at that time. And uh, that was in 1990. Uh, uh, we just did for 18 months. NSF, NOAA, I mean, and, and NASA both said they will fund it for all of this. And then European Center did. Uh, uh, and then, of course, to cut a long story short, finally in 1994, I think that uh, Eugenia's paper that uh, this, I, I just wanted to end that with, uh, with, uh, with, with that paper because, as you say, the rest became history uh, after that. And there's one comment that I told you that a very smart person made. I wanted to save it before you hear start. But that was Paul Julian. You guys might remember Paul Julian? He was a brilliant man. And he came and he said, said to me that, you know, the analysis is not very useful unless you can include future data. And I thought that was a very smart comment. 
And when I called Irina last week about the future of the analysis, that was exactly her comment that she told me. And then she sent me two papers that she's just writing, but she has done it now, how to include, uh, to include data. So I really, uh, Bob, I think I just, first of all, thanks Mil, Eugenia, Bob, all of you, for really creating that environment in that Mill's Palace, in that uh, Building 22, was it Building 22? I think, yeah, Building 22, uh, uh, and this, uh, to be able to really have a very good discussion, have the idea, and uh, Bob, we really are so proud to be your friend. You were the one person who always was balancing milk, volatile uh, <laughs> sort of atmosphere with, I mean, I mean just absolutely calm. Uh, I mean, I, 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 and, and, and always friendly. Uh, it, just, it was so easy to talk to and uh, so easy to talk about science. I remember still talking to you about postages traffic, vertigy attraction. I mean, we just really, would have that was a great advantage of having office uh, next to each other. It has been a real pleasure to know you, and all the best to you for the future years. Thank you. All right. Thank you so very much. Professor Shukla. Now we get to go to <laughs> Professor Kare and we go to it's that wonderful title. So, sorry, uh, is that the, the okay? <laughs> Wrong thing. Okay. That one. There we go. And here, if you need to advance your slides. Okay. There we go. And so, uh, from the University of Maryland, and a very long career with Dr. Atlas, uh, Professor Yehani Kalni, please welcome. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> what wonderful talks we had this morning. Yeah, oh, sorry, sorry. We had incredible talks, and it's difficult to follow. Uh, I'm particularly happy to see you also meet Hayden. Okay, so uh, I will first talk a little bit about the same Building 22 in NASA where, where we were. But, uh, actually, I realized that we've been interacting more than 40 years. It's amazing. And it started for me really bad because uh, we were at, uh, in 1970. Eight, I think uh, we or 77. We were both going to this on on different weekdays, but um, at least in in New York, uh, it was a, a lot of people and a small building, and they gave me a, a very small, tiny office. And then, the, uh, since we were coming different days of the week. In, in that little office, I saw that somebody else had taken over, and it was Bob Atlas, so I, 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 I just hated him <laughs> before I, I, I met you. But once I met you, it all disappeared, actually. I was thinking, I cannot remember in these 40 years a single situation in which we had a confrontation. We always agree, and, and even though we have very different uh, fields, so. So, I don't know. <laughs> so then Mills Hayer came, and that changed completely everything. And uh, I want I want to express my deep gratitude to to uh, to him. He's there. And um, he created uh, a global, uh, I think it was called Global Modeling and Simulation Facility, as, as uh, uh, Shukla said, not, not branch, but I put branch. And our NASA code was 911, so they, <laughs> they knew we were going to produce trouble. <laughs> 
And we had a climate group and Shukla actually, since we were a branch, we had a branch and we had uh, subgroups there, he called them twigs. So we had a, a climate twig directed by Shukla and a, a weather group directed by me. And we had Bobatlas who was <laughs> deeply understood the atmosphere more than anyone else I know. And, and uh, <laughs> I, it, it's amazing, but it sounds exactly like what Shukla said, only not so well said. So we, we uh, both and I were soon uh, following the orders of, of Milhelm, <laughs> uh, doing I have to say the, the vision of creating a, a, brand, uh, a group that was going to do the CIGI year uh, uh, 1979 data, which for the first time had satellite data and do data simulation and show that it was useful. It was a brilliant idea of Milton bringing both to, to help was great. So I, uh, uh, this year that I spent under Mint with, with uh, uh, Shukla and Bob are, are, are really incredible, uh, uh, were fantastic. So, but with time we, let, we all left and, and Shukla went to Kola and then to G, uh, G, GMU. And I went to Enstead and then to the University of Maryland, and Bob became the director of AOML and a legend as the poster. So we met and interacted all these years and learned from each other. And I worked with my student, Kusun Chen, and a couple of other students also on, on something which we call proactive quality control. Uh, which is kind of magic. It, it allows you to identify and delete detrimental observations. And we found that uh, PQC, proactive quality control, where, where you identify and, and delete the bad observations uh, results in major forecast improvement. And, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll, most of the talk, talk but it's not long, uh, is about the, uh, this EFSO ensemble forecast sensitivity to observations and uh, proactive quality control. And so I, uh, I, I can, uh, as I will show you, the results are very good with real forecast, but I thought uh, since uh, Bob, who has become, uh, who, who has been for many years the recognized top expert in observ OSIS, observing system simulation experiments, would perhaps be interested in combining uh, our system of ensemble focus sensitivity to observations and proactive quality control, and combining it with OSIS to vastly increase their usefulness. And, uh, uh, Bob, as, as always, even 40 years later, was very positive and, and he said very kindly, I, I never saw one of Eugenia's good ideas fail, so why don't we test it? And, and, and we decided to test it and, and uh, Lydia is directing that. So we are uh, collaborating in creating an uh, OSI ESSO and some reporter sensitivity to observation system that identifies whether each observation is beneficial or detrimental, and then we drop them. So, uh, the, this, uh, this is a, 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 a very short presentation on, on this, and Setun uh, Chen and, and uh, Daisuke Jota and Woyan and several other people have have uh, participated. So, what is classic data simulation? I want to thank Frank Marx for saying that data simulation is so important. It is. It is important because uh, in the classic 
data simulation, we have uh, uh, observations and uh, six hour forecast and, analy and analysis. And the, the six, uh, every six hours, we make a new forecast and get new observations. And we make a forecast on the on the right. We get the new observations six hours later on the left, and and combine them in an analysis, which which is the heart of the data simulation. For example, for the bar or ensemble pattern filter, and then combine them to to get the new analysis, which is the in new initial condition for the next model forecast. So. Uh, Data simulation has improved so much that now we can in, we can use the analysis to improve the observations and to improve the model. So we we are going to talk about the left improving the, the observations. And uh, so we uh, we we identify and delete detrimental observations to improve the analysis and the forecast. So the idea is to use slightly future observations to quality control the current observations. And it, uh, because the observations that we get in, in the, you know, on the left are generally beneficial, but many, uh, so they, they improve the six hour forecast and improve forecast or beneficial means uh, it's, it's shown with blue. But there are also observations that are detrimental, which are uh, shown with the red arrow that makes the result worse. So how to identify the good ones from the, the bad ones? And uh, so we use, for, for this, we temporarily use uh, the observations six hours later. Uh, not, not at zero, but at six hours, and then uh, uh, we create a new analysis after six hours temporarily, and this is the best approximation to the truth. So, uh, the, we, we, we stop there, and then we go back to, to, to uh, the previous time, zero hours, and and so we so we check each observation at time equal to zero now back to uh, time equal to zero and we compare it, uh, the forecast from from those observations with the analysis and we check whether it improved the analysis or it made it worse and that's basically how we distinguish between. Uh, beneficial and detrimental observations, so we can delete the, the detrimental observations. And uh, sorry, and, uh, so the final analysis is cycled, so it's done in a, again and again, and it accumulates the improvements obtained every six hours by deleting the, the detrimental observations and assimilating only the beneficial observations. So we we uh, delete the detrimental observations, only use the beneficial, and, and we do a, 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 a final analysis that has only beneficial observations, and, uh, and this is done again and again in time, and so the improvement accumulates. As a result, both the analysis and the modern forecast improve substantially, and I will show it. A result and this is an example of uh, all the observations to set radiances. Actually, all, all uh, observ observations of different instruments and each one was uh, estimated uh, using EFSO, whether it's beneficial, in which case it's blue or detrimental, and the size is how beneficial or detrimental. So you can see, for example, airplanes. Uh, uh, but uh, we, we also see that, for example, in high latitude, there is a whole bunch on the left corner of red observations. And this, these are the detrimental modest wings observations that we discovered 
just by doing this experiment of changing the color and the sphere. So uh, let, let me just uh, show you an uh, overall uh, uh, result of, of done over a period of one month. And we used a, a modern uh, and a data simulation very efficient uh, resolution P62 because we don't have access to, to, to enough uh, to, to operational computers. So it has not yet been tested at, at then. So data uh, uh, we, we did, uh, these are the characteristics of what we did. And, and I would like to note that, that the, the method is efficient, it uses a, a, a version of the GFS that's efficient but quite uh, realistic for, for, for the resolution. So we, we found, first of all, that by citing the, the reduction of analysis errors, it uh, uh, became accumulated. So we, we find that, that uh, correcting the observations correct reduces the, the error at the average monthly error for all variables that are all high. Because there are very few places where you see a, a little bit of red, strongly blue. And uh, especially uh, uh, <coughs> the, the, the tropic, uh, the moisture in the tropics, for example, in, in uh, improves quite a lot. And this is uh, when I saw, this is my favorite uh, figure that made me very happy because we subtracted the, the uh, error of the control, which is, since we subtract the control is zero, so zero is the, the, the control. And the, for, and the reduction of, of error over 10 days. And <clears throat> the red line, which is uh, the, the small reduction, it was reduced in that cycle. And the green line and the blue line are the, the accumulated reduction of error <coughs> and, and the total reduction of error. So you can see that, that the, the most of the reduction of errors is not because of, of the six hours of <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> is it better or worse? Shall I start again? So we you can see that, that most, uh, probably more than ninety percent of the benefit comes from the accumulated correction. So the the, the accumulated uh, plastic quality control can be done even in operations, even if you didn't have time to 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 do it for the later observations. And uh, I, uh, how how much time? Um, you have you have fifteen minutes. Okay. So I, I very quickly will explain uh, uh, some of the focal sensitivity and how, uh, how it's useful. Uh, so this was, uh, if you look at the left, I am I not the good mathematician, but somehow I was illuminated and I was able to uh, do, to derive the, the same equation that Lanner and Baker Derived to estimate the future uh, reduction, the reduction of, of, of the error by each observation, but instead of doing it using a joint model, which is a test, to speak frankly, we, we use ensemble, and that's why it's called focus, ensemble focus sensitivity to observation. So we, we basically, on the left, uh, we have the error, uh, the error between the, the forecast with the observation and the out of the observation. And uh, the error with, with the observation should be smaller 
that without the observation. So that that should be the beneficial. If, if the observation is beneficial, the error should be negative. So if it's negative, if delta is square, it's negative for each observation. Uh, we say it's beneficial. Uh, you can, put, can compute this for each observation, um, and if it's positive, we say it's detrimental, and that, that's it. It's very simple. So we we did an experiment also for a month, but with higher resolution and using all the observations at that time, and uh, and I want to show this, which is also. Very favorite. Well, when I saw this, I, I was filled with joy. This shows for each observation on the left whether the ESO is negative, in which case the bottom, which is beneficial, or if it is positive, which is detrimental, is making the work of work. And Ideally, all the observations should be beneficial, but there is a, a large number of, of observations that are about the line, and especially in modest wings. But there are also atlas by all some profiler wings that have the detrimental episodes. <coughs> and this is another example. Uh, actually, this is a great improvement. For India, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, it, this shows that for that month uh, there were many very good songs that were great and, and only two that were detrimental. But it, this is a very uh, specific. That's a big problem. Ten years ago, all of them were detrimental. I know, I know. I, I want that show that I try to say uh, uh, that this is a great improvement. India. And, uh, but but you can you can if you plot if you plot this anybody can look and say oh my instrument is having bad uh, bad periods. So the, this this is a, a an old instrument first and the challenge I think is shown to be. Um, uh, detrimental all the all the time, and, and that channel is also in several other instruments. Uh, 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 at the top left, uh, there are different other instruments, and, and they all have detrimental observations for the channel for things. And uh, this. Uh, even hyper speaker instruments you can apply. For example, you can see that Ayasi has a whole bunch of, of uh, uh, channels that are mainly in the sensitivity near the surface that are detrimental. And if such a single one which happens to be happens to be the channel 13. And uh, so the thing my, my student, former student, uh, uh, did an experiment just dropping 16 channels out of it, more than uh, many hundreds, and, and he got an improvement. Uh, and, and this uh, problem with the channel setting is especially near the surface in the tropics. So he, for the tropics, he, he got uh, more than 1%, several percent, actually. Uh, improvement just just by by that simple thing and uh, okay so for example here we have Ayasi on the left and 2012 and 2017 and you can see that there are many more channels but there are also more detrimental channels so uh, and Chris also has has uh, uh, several problematic. Cetrin uh, 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 invented uh, uh, an extra extra browsing tool that if you look at the bottom, choose location time instrument and instantly you get the extra. And uh, so now, now uh, very quickly uh, 
some results with a simple model, which is the Lorenz 96. And here uh, we plotted for the 40 variables of, of the model the error, and we we put the order of the observations up from most elemental to most beneficial. And, and it's quite interesting to see that even though the, the Lorentz model was using, was using observations that were not flawed, it's not as if it has an error in the boundary layer or something like that. It's just the Gaussian and some of the Gaussian are, are, are worse. And, but still, if we just drop 10% of the observations that are not, not even flawed, we, we get an improvement of the forecast. And, and this is perhaps the most hopeful part. The, uh, what worried us was that after choosing and deleting the observations, we had to redo the analysis, and that's too expensive. The analysis is very expensive. But case of fortunately, uh, uh, you can you can use EXO, which is already computed and it's essentially free, and that improves the analysis in the base, and it's the green line which has errors. Uh, uh, even if you uh, that, that acceptable, even if you reject sixty percent or something like that, so it's it's really cheap. Also, because it uses the results of the of of of, of the ensemble and uh, so uh, wait. so ad advanced data simulation can be used to improve both the model and the observations and and. We use future data observations to create a six hour temporary analysis that we use as the best estimate of the truth, and that then we use EXO to correct that. And, and the results are, are really amazing. It is still how to look with the, with the, to make an average of, of the runs and and try to find with the microscope the, the difference in, in skill. The, these are, are, are really visible, the, the improvement in the skill. And uh, EXO on, uh, is almost cost free, and since it accumulates the improvements, it does not need future observations in operational and in the OLP. But, uh, so, so I, I wanted to mention since. Uh, uh, Shooter talked so beautifully about reanalysis. Uh, I wanted to mention reanalysis now. Uh, the Tiku Miyakoda uh, said if you want to improve long range forecast, do not use future data, which is something very easy to do if you use climatology, for example, and forget that that's future, future data. Okay, so, uh, but. When, when I showed these results, or the preliminary results of both of the, the ISO and proactive quality control in, in Montreal, in, in a data simulation meeting in 2014, Dick uh, Dick, uh, who directed the IRA in the analysis, said we should use this for the next reanalysis. We don't have a problem getting future observations because we already have them. And, and he tried and then dying to do experiments of reanalysis using future data that we know and extending this from six hours to maybe two days or three days. And that should improve the reanalysis significantly. It, and uh, uh, so, uh, Bob Atlas and Lilia Kukuru uh, said EXO PQC is simple, low cost, and complements OSIS. So let's combine OSIS with EXO. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have just a couple of minutes before we break. Are there any questions from the audience for our previous two speakers? Well, 
beyond. So I think as Louis pointed out a good thing. This is a 35 year rewind discussion about yeah. outside of all the NASA, right? <laughs> Yes, you can leave your bags here. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.